ourselves. Oh, yes, because therapy is a process, not an event. Yeah, yeah. You go down the layers of the defense systems. Yeah. Uh, and of course, they're not really defending against you. That's the most important thing. And the therapist that I said over defends or sees their transactions as criticism or an attempt to annihilate them in some ways, um, the, they're, they're on a hiding to nothing. They need to see the transactions as really a defense process and also an attempt to connect. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful Bob Cook, as always, and myself, Jackie Jones. And this is episode 55, and we're going to be talking about love and compassion in the therapy process. I love this title. (laughs) What do you love about it? I'm all about love and compassion for ourself as well as other people. Well, that was one of the videos we did about uh, exactly that topic. Yes. It's about love and compassion for ourselves. Well, no, I think it was the compassion. Well, I don't know what video it was, really. But anyway, we did. We talked about love and compassion for ourselves as well as love and compassion for our clients. Yeah. I think really it was important. The compassion Fatigue podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, okie dokie. So where do you want to start with this then, Jackie? wherever you want to start and let's see where it takes us yeah sometimes (laughs) Uh, i must admit sometimes it i'm really conscious of where i am in the room when i look at love and compassion because if my headspace isn't in the right place sometimes i find it more difficult than others to be compassionate generally in life not just in the therapy room yeah i think we all have our own internal processes that are going on yeah, I really agree with that. Um, well, let's start with this. Though I, love and compassion, I think, is an intention that I come from. So, yeah. for example, um, it's in, it's in it's a desire of mine, and I, I think about it a lot because it's the basis of self esteem for the other. However, quite a lot of clients aren't able to take love in. Very true. People that I see, because for lots of reasons, from they've not been brought up in a diet of love and compassion, they've been brought up in a diet of other processes. So they yeah. they often may think that, the, that, that some of my um, positive strokes that I give or some of my loving transactions or some of my nurturing, using t- let's use TA language, nurturing channel transactions um not only they see that as an alien they uh are not in a place to actually be able to take that in and that uh, those sort of nurturing uh transactions might actually overwhelm them yeah the place where they go underground that's one uh process another one is the especially people with paranoid traits particularly may think it's a trick yeah. These nurturing transactions. That's um, what I was going to say. They can be a bit suspicious. <laughs> there's ulterior yeah. motives going on. <laughs> yeah, so they so there's another whole process there. So I think it's it, it's important if you're not being if the client hasn't been brought up on a full meal, they've been brought on upon crumbs, then they are easily going to accept nurturing transactions. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's that's really interesting. So what would you do in that situation? Would you bring that into their awareness and, and ask them how did they feel when you said that? Well that's 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 one aspect you could do. Um I think I'm just aware of it and I and I wish to find out where that process or pattern of crumbs comes from. So yeah. A historical inquiry. Um, the the other one is just to be aware of it. I think internally myself, 
Look, I could ch share that, and that would be an historical inquiry into that whole process. But, you know, if I was to deal this behaviourally in terms of what transactions I might give, it, I might give um, negative conditional strokes. In, basically, let's look at the way, what I call a stroke sandwich. Yeah. So in other words, I, let's give an example. Of that. Someone's late for therapy. So I might say, well, you know, Joanne, let's make a name up. Joanne, I really find it frustrating when you keep, you know, coming late for therapy. And it's really good to see you. And I'd really like you to change this behavior. Yeah. So you've got a positive nurturing transaction in the middle of the uh, uh, more challenging transactions. Yeah. Now, if they're used to neg negative transactions or uh, the crumbs I talked about, then actually that will fit into their frame of reference. So you are actually giving a positive transaction in the middle of the sandwich. So that's that. And another way to look at the same process is to think of it as a cocktail of strokes. So you slip in these positive nurturing transactions uh, in, the, in the stroke sandwich. Yeah. I think generally as human beings, we're, we're a lot better at accepting negative comments or strokes than we are positive. That's a really interesting one. That I mean, I know what you mean. If you just took nine people out of ten from from the uh, population, perhaps they would be able to say quickly what they don't like about things rather than what they do like a thing about things. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from. However, I also think that, that that how people are parented has a lot to do with this. Yeah. Yeah, and you know. It, it, I'm not sure whether it's TA or, or one of the things I often say with clients is that our brain is designed to notice the negatives for our survival. So it, it does tend to err on the side of caution a lot of the time. So we'll hear the negatives and accept those, whereas the positives, our survival doesn't usually depend on positive things. Positive transactions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yes, that's good to bear in mind. And the types of client, that's true, Jackie, I don't want to take that away. And the transact, the clients we're more likely to see are clients have been brought up on crumbs yeah. rather than a full meal. Yeah. And I, I can relate with that. I find it very uncomfortable if somebody's positive or shows me any form of affection outside of a relationship, if that makes sense. I physically recoil sometimes from it. Well, certainly if you've been brought up with that. I mean, I used to go to Gambia a lot. And I, I think I might have said this story on another podcast, but well, I can repeat it. I think it's an interesting story. And when I went there, of course, once I got used to the poverty, if you do get used to the poverty, uh, I remember saying to my wife, well, I must, when I come next time, I'm going to bring a um, Christmas dinner, because we used to go Christmas time with yeah. all the trappings, you know, of the potatoes and uh, all the you know, all, all the trappings and uh, of a Christmas dinner uh, and my wife thought I was completely mad um, and she said you know they won't be able to eat that I said why because their stomach their stomachs are so shrunken and small they'll be sick yeah and if you think that is a metaphor for what we're talking yeah. about here then if you've not been brought up with those um, positive nurturing transactions, then you, you, you'll you be overwhelmed. Yeah. I like that metaphor. That's something that I use a lot of the time. It's kind of like, you know, if I'm working with a parent and I'm talking about, you know, positive affirmations and praise and recognition and those sorts of things, it's about giving them a juicy Sunday dinner rather than junk food. Yeah. You know, if we praise them and just say, oh, good job, it's that's like junk food. Whereas if we're specific about what we're praising them for, then that's like having a Sunday dinner with all the nutrition that they need and it, it's validation. So it, it's kind of a similar thing, but yeah, it's important. It's on the same, same ballpark. That doesn't mean, sorry, even with that knowledge, it doesn't mean that you lose the intention yeah. um, to, to, to deliver nurturing, nurturing compassion. But 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 it does it does help clinical thinking if you think about it that way. Yeah. Because then you, as I said earlier, some of the tran transactions will be like a stroke cocktail, where you might 
slip some of these positive transactions in, uh, you know, to fit it, but also be aware of their frame of reference. Yeah. You need to get back to where all this began. Yeah. So you're doing the healing back there. A lot, a lot of, you know, clients and people in general, their upbringing is normal to them. Mm. So they've got nothing to compare it to, you know, the, the, the way that they were parented is quite normal to them. Mm. To get the crumbs becomes the norm. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so given what all the what I've just said, it doesn't mean that people can't develop um, the capacity for increased self-esteem or increased uh, care for themselves. Yeah. It certainly means that I think the therapist needs to think about the context of the work they're doing it in. Yeah. Yeah, because it's modelling it as well in a way, isn't it? So that they can then show it to themselves and to others. You know, self-love. A lot of people I speak to think that, you know, self-care and self-love is selfish. It's, you know, you should be focusing on the other rather than yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's it's breaking the mould, especially when you say, well, actually, no, it's not. You should prioritise yourself. Oh, we're talking about love and compassion for ourselves. Certainly that needs to be there so that you can model it out. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the, there's a lot written on this, but we do know that love and compassion for ourselves are the building blocks of self-esteem. Yeah. But unless the therapist can model that, um, then the client often doesn't have a model to follow. Yeah. Now you model it by not only nurturing transactions, but by things that you do. So for example, maybe simple things like, you know, making them a cup of tea, it might be taking account, taking account of how they're feeling and thinking, asking them how they are, just to do, it might even be just sort of some very caring pastime in transactions. Yeah. Um, so by showing compassion and love or nurture to the people um that's modeling in itself yeah yeah and i think that's that's a really important thing to to model in you know not not just like you were saying earlier on it's about the intent behind the connection you know and and i want to say proving that there is no ulterior motive that's just how you are with people Yeah, and quite often what's written about in terms of what we're talking about is the client needs to see the heart of the therapist. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting one because some of our clients may never have experienced the heart of the father or the tears of the father or the heart of their important parental figures. So it becomes uh, an interesting one clinically. And what does it mean? I think it means not just the words of validation and nurturing what I'm just talking about here, but actions, as I've just said, to account for what they're feeling, to ask them how they are, to spend time being curious about the person and getting to know the person. I mean, that's the prerequisite for any therapy, I think. Yeah. Because these times people might never have had people asking, well, how are you today? Yeah. What's going on for you? Ah. For some people, it might seem very straightforward, uh, easy transactions. And for some clients, they've not actually experienced that before. No. Now, that might sound strange to these list- the listeners on the podcast, but actually, often, you'll find out it's true. Yeah. And to just have that space for themselves. Yeah. Mm, mm. And uh, I think it's really important to allow the space what we're talking about here even if you have to fill the space do it with curiosity questions yeah how are you how have you been since the last session um i've been thinking about you what's been happening for you that's powerful that Mm. yeah So so you're really accounting for them and those are loving transactions whether the client is in a space to be able to receive them 
as loving transactions or even understand they are it's a completely another story yeah well I, I know it's a bit random but it just kind of came into my head so i'm going to say it anyway what if it's misinterpreted by the client what if your intent and your love and compassion is misinterpreted by the client where does that leave you so are you okay so give me an example jackie well, I'm just thinking, you know, we, we are quite vulnerable in, in that room as far as, you know, allegations or, you know, oh. things like that. If, if somebody's not used to having, you know, love and compassion in a relationship of any description, you know, what happens if it is misunderstood in the therapy room? Oh, you mean if they think that you're being seductive or if yeah. they think you're being overly familiar or overly whatever familiar. term you want to use it well hopefully they would say something to you back like that uh so that you knew what was happening and if you didn't know what was happening you'd say something like and is it familiar for you to take kind words as over familiarity yeah i tried to find out um the pattern you know uh is this what happens do you feel this a lot that people are out to be over familiar or uh, what is it? Well, I might go another way and say, oh, that's interesting. Certainly that was not my intent. Yeah. What did you find particularly over familiar in my transactions to you? So they might say, well, uh, you know, I, I, I don't uh, ever have anybody saying, uh, these sorts of things to me unless they want something for me from me well I'm really sad to hear that and perhaps you could tell me a little bit more about this yeah so you would bring that into the room you would you know obviously hopefully they would say something to you so that you can talk about it yeah now if yeah. they're not going to say anything then I think the therapist is on a harder track um, but usually through their body language or their non-verbal signals, you will pick up if they've withdrawn defensively. Yeah. Oh, so you so you seem to have moved back in your chair when I talked to you, uh, when I was saying, how are you? What's been going on for you? Was that too a difficult transaction for you to hear? Yeah. And well, I, I think this is really important that, you know, when, when we are in the therapy process, we're looking at everything at different levels. There's, there's, you know, half a dozen different things going on in every transaction. Especially the non-verbal. Yeah. The unsaid. Yeah. Process, what's happening on a non-verbal level. Yeah. And usually as a rule of thumb, I will bring it to their attention. Uh, what's you know? Are you aware that at the moment you've clenched your um, fist? Yeah. Is there a sense that you're frustrated at me, or something that I might be doing which you don't like, or is difficult for you? Yeah. And again, you know, that can be really powerful because they're not used to being observed or noticed in the the body language yeah uh, that's the that's the that's that's the thing uh you're talking about here and um i think on a really important topic here about this but the most important thing is that you don't go defensive yeah the therapist doesn't go into a defensive place and feel attacked or feel criticized or something like that because if you go that way then they may never come back. Yeah. It's, it's, you see, we have to think of their world, you know, where from their frame of reference, they may find nurturing transactions not only familiar, they may find them over familiar, they may find them alien, but it's a job of the therapist to be curious and to try and find out what's happening for the person yeah now that in itself as you've just said can be very empower empowering 
because they may have never been accounted for in that way before. Yeah, totally, yeah. The trap is, though, if the therapist goes defensive, oh, how come you spoke to... I've never done any... I've done nothing on that might be warranted, warranted as unfamiliar or over-familiar or a sense of uh, over-familiarity. Where did you get that from? Now that's the... That defensive set of transactions yeah. are really not therapeutic. No. And will usually lead to the client not coming back again. Yeah. And again, oh. in, in, you know, in the early days of, you know, being a therapist, all these sort of things, it's like a minefield sometimes when you're in the therapy room. There's, there's no other place I can think of where you would experience anything like being in a therapy room with somebody either as a client or as a therapist it's kind of like the twilight zone it's it's a very special relationship that happens in a therapy room it's very special and it's also confidential yeah important this is a safe place for them to experiment yeah and I always admire the clients that allow me to reach their vulnerable self because that's often the place where, which is most difficult for them. Yeah. And that's why I'm talking about compassion, where I can, um, I feel most compassionate when I'm working with that's the vulnerable self, if you like. Yeah. Um, which you know, I know we've touched on it before in other podcasts. Can take a long time for a client to be comfortable and trust you enough to show that part of themselves. Oh yes, because therapy is a process, not an event. Yeah, yeah. You go down the layers of the defense systems. Yeah, uh, and of course they're not really defending against you. That's the most important thing. And the therapist that I said over defends or sees their transactions as criticism or an attempt to annihilate them in some ways, um, the, they're, they're only hiding to nothing. They need to see the transactions as really a defense process and also an attempt to connect. Yeah. Because, you know, the way, the way I see things this here, that. Therapy is a contact-oriented process, and we need to understand the um, breaks in the contact seeking, as well as looking out for ways to contact them. Yeah. So when they go perhaps into criticism or attack, it's really important the therapist doesn't parallel that. They need to find out what's behind it all. Uh, but you can only do that in a way if you see the vulnerable self of the client so then my compassion will come out more yeah that's a really good point because even when a client withdraws the communication <coughs> when they disconnect you know they're, they're communicating something to you Oh, when they disconnect, they're always communicating, yeah. communicating something to you. Um, and that's where the therapy often is. Yeah. They I've got some it. clients that, you know, that do that so often, you know, years down the road. I can tell whether there's something coming up for them or whether I've hit a nerve or something because they just literally disconnect. <laughs> so the question when somebody disconnects is where have you gone? Yeah. And how you say it's really important. Yeah. So I've noticed that you've you seem really quiet. Is this something I've done, or are you able to know what that's about? So it's more like a a query set of transactions, but it's said in a nurturing way. Yeah. And with yeah. with some clients, I've I've learned, <clears throat> you know, over time of seeing them and building up a relationship that what they're wanting is for me to ask them something so that it gives them permission to tell me something, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So if I say to them, what's going on for you right now? It gives them an opening that they can tell me what it actually is that they want to tell me. Yeah. 
because but there's a, they a, can't a, do it yeah hundred yeah, percent often because they are too young yeah developmentally yeah, yeah. And a relational need to initiate, the relational need for a significant person to initiate is a really important process. Yeah. Because they're too young to do it. 100%. Or they've never had somebody seen them as important enough to initiate. Yeah. And often the withdrawn clad desire is for the therapist to initiate. Yeah, then which again be... could be seen as, as love and compassion to initiate that contact. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully the uh, the client feels it as well. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Yeah. That's really interesting, Bob. Yeah, I think the relational need to have, for a significant person to initiate um, is it's important for the clinician to think about because sometimes people have been trained, uh, you know, not in transaction analysis, not in my, my model, but in other models, to stay behind the client and just wait for the client to um, speak. And I understand the, um, the given reasons for that. And uh, I think, if they don't understand unmet relational needs, um, they won't go down the road of initiating. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's a great shame. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I mean, the withdrawn client is often waiting because, and unfortunately, uh, their history might have been they've been waiting for um, the mother, the father to ask them how they are, to initiate to account for them, and it's never happened. So they withdraw even more. And the child is, child's desire and the unmet relational needs is just once for the mother, the father, or significant other to say, how are you? Please tell me what's happening for you. Yeah. And that's really loving, powerful transaction often yeah. for people. It is. Um it, it, may, it does make a noticeable difference, you know, particularly with the client that I'm thinking of, they immediately reconnect. As soon as that, you know, I've initiated something, they're straight back in it. And I have, you know, it, it, at times left the pause and not initiated it to see whether they would, you know, come back and reconnect, but it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. I think that, <clears throat> what we're talking about is also is different levels of connection. So there's emotional connection, there's cognitive connection, there's a behavioral connection. And sometimes we need to uh, really look at how we connect. So mm. the person who's been stroke positively, for example, cognition, what they desire is somebody to say, I understand you think in this way. How do you feel today? Yeah. Now that's a compassion transaction to yeah. a completely different dimension. Yeah. Lots of my clients have tremendously high, what I call IQs, you know, in terms of cognition, and very low EQs, emotional yeah. intelligence. And that's because that side hasn't been recognized. Yeah, that would work with me, Bob, you saying that, connecting with the thinking and then bringing the feelings in. That wouldn't frighten me. <laughs> I would accept that, yeah. <laughs> because the desire is to be seen emotionally. Yeah. From a compassion, loving, caring place. If you do that repetitively, um, the person will see that and feel that nurture. Yeah. And, we'll, and it, will, it will meet an un, unmet early need. Yeah. It's a wonderful job that we do, Bob, isn't it? Well, it, 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 and we can only do it really where we started off, Jack, where you started off, which is to have a, a care and kindness for ourselves. Yeah. Because then, of course, we will, by osmosis and nothing else, pass that down to our clients. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. 
if we don't like ourselves, if we hate ourselves, if we have little self-esteem, how can we ever model that down to our clients? Yeah. That's one of the reasons the need for therapy, I think. That's why we all need therapy, to get to the parts which actually are more the darker parts of ourselves so we don't pass it down to our clients, besides the fact it will change our own personal worlds. Mm. But in terms of the job, if we're going to do this job successfully, we need to understand ourselves. We need to, to be kind and friendly to ourselves so we can pass that down onto our clients. Yeah. So love and compassion for ourselves is what you said at the beginning of the podcast. And I completely agree with you. If we haven't got that as a basis, this job is much harder in terms of modeling or even passing that down verbally. Yeah. I I completely agree with that. Yeah. So we will leave it there, Bob. And okay. what we're doing on the next one kind of I think links <clears throat> with what you've just said there because the next podcast is going to be the five most important qualities a therapist needs to cultivate for an effective therapy <laughs> which is a mouthful that's well, what I'm gonna, doing. <laughs> well, that's i'm going to end the yeah yeah i'm looking forward to that one and i want to say to the end this one to say love and god bless to all the podcast listeners and, it, and also the people that watch us on uh, uh, the youtube channel Yes. What a wonderful way to end it. I love that. Yes. And yeah, it, it, it's like a cold. We can spread it really fast if we have love and compassion and it does pass on through osmosis. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not going to hurt anybody. No, that's a really important sentence. It won't hurt anyone. In fact, it'll do the opposite. Yes. You're so until going. next time, Bob. Good. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.